Uh, our next speaker is Pascal. Uh, he's a well-known uh, contributor to the community around here. He's been organizing meetups in, in Fribourg, in Freiburg. Um, and he's, um, he's the CEO of uh, Ethos Digital, an agency in Fribourg. And yes, he's basically a well-known face around here. Um, his talk will be about the new Swiss law and data protection uh, that's going to uh, uh, appear this year. So a big round of applause for Pascal. Okay, I will start with a, with a small story. When I was a kid, when I was a teenager, I liked to play board games. This was before we had the kind of games we have today. And I was always carefully reading the rules. You know, all the rules, maybe it was a long book, like I would read everything, study it, then I would try all the situations in the game, and then I would start to play with my brother and my family. And they would say, explain to us the rule. I will explain the rules. And then in the game, of course, I had not the time to explain everything, so I would win in the beginning. And then they had to learn the game. And then they said, well, no, 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 no. You, we, we don't play with you if we don't know all the rules. Okay, I will explain all the rules. Page one, page two, page three. And they would get bored. So let's play. And I say, okay, we play, but then you cannot reproach me that you don't know all the rules. And basically this is what happens on internet. You go and you download an app, and then you have all those conditions, and you scroll, and you scroll, and it's long, and you click yes. And by doing this, you have created a contract, you have given your consent to all those rules, which were written by a bunch of smart lawyers, if, especially if it's a big company, and they have a big advantage on you because they were able to create all those rules and you accept them because you want to use a website. Let's just take one random website as an example, right? Maybe you have used it already in your life. So if you come here and you start to, to type things, it will collect your data about all your, your searches, right? So it will use Google has immense knowledge and capability to, to collect data and then to, to have a profile, a specific profile of who you are, your political and religious opinions, uh, your preferences, your commercial value in specific markets. They will do all of this. So if you want to know about what they are doing, of course you can come here and click on privacy and terms. But very few people do this. And my point with this introduction is that by never reading this, you are playing a game where you don't know the rules, like my brother was playing games with me without knowing the rules completely. So having some interest at least in what you are doing when you are saying yes, means you are taking back a little bit of control about your digital life. So now we will speak about the new law in Switzerland. It's a, a law that was passed and approved in the parliament in 2020, and there was a long process to make it happen as a law in force in Switzerland. There were many debates, I will explain, explain this, and now it will come in force in September. And it's not like the European law that they give two years of adaptation for businesses. For this law, they give like no day. It's like it comes in force in September and all websites have to comply. And then from the 1st of September, if you don't respect those things I will explain today, you are outside the law in Switzerland. So my presentation has three parts. First, what is data protection? Second part is about the new Swiss law about data protection. And finally, more applied to specifically websites and maybe WordPress websites, what does it mean as um, website owner, and what does it mean for you as individual going on the web? So what is data protection? So first we have to think about the, import, the importance of data. We have to understand the stakes around the law and the conflict there was in Switzerland in the making of the law. And we can also talk about the European law because of course it was a precursor to the Swiss law. So first, data is knowledge, knowledge about individuals. And knowledge is a form of power also. I mean, think about the history of the world and how people will torture each other to have information for political purposes. 
think about how much if you have an adversary, let's say you play chess, you want to study exactly the moves and the style of game of your opponent to know where you could um, exploit weaknesses in the pattern of his game. So you want to know whom you are playing with, right? So knowledge gives you an advantage, an edge. And here, when we speak about personal data, if a company has more data about people, they can use it for a commercial reason. The talk just before mine showed that, right? If you, if you know things about your potential customers, you can use it uh, commercially. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm just saying it's a fact. It's how it works. So how data is used, it's used in marketing. Um, for example, Amazon was pioneering this in, in a way when they did the online shop. You would um, choose a book, and then they will look in the database who had bought the kind of same book, and they will propose you relevant books. And it's very powerful. I mean, I like it. When I go to Amazon, they propose all books, and I want to buy all of them. And I like to buy books, so my credit cards may have problems, right? But then also I understand what they are doing to me, right? They are collecting data, and they know things about me. They know books I would like that I don't know I would like. And they show it to me in the right moment, and it influences my decision. So this is marketing. And sales, meaning like if you want to, to find a customer, you will study your customer. What is his business, his budget, um, his approach, his personality. It will help you negotiate with this person. Then it's used also, of course, in internal operation in a business, like how you lead projects, how you organize everything, how people communicate. This is all connected with data, with HR. When you are hiring people, now you have software that will go online and find everything that is relevant about a specific person, and especially if he had problems or legal issues, everything that is online, you can find this. So if you have no right to erase some traces of what you did in the past, it's a big disadvantage. And maybe people also slander you. They say things against you. It's not true. So do you have a right to do something about this? And this law, European law and now Swiss law, allows you to, to do something about it, which I find very important. And finance also is, is, a, big, um, is a big part uh, where data is important. So I want to, sp to speak now about some of the stakes and challenges. And here I found a, a definition of privacy because I think this word is kind of the key and the foundation of the whole discussion. So privacy is a state in which one is not observed or disturbed by other people. I mean, you can find different definition in, in the dictionary. It comes from a Latin word, privatus. It means being by yourself, but also not being observed. So you have to think that now this law and those stakes are so important because in the dig digital age, as soon as you are online, you're observed, right? If you are in a website, they are collecting data already. If you go, if you go somewhere on a shop, they are collecting data. So it means that Privacy is difficult online because everything is trackable. And therefore, the law, this law is very important because it gives back some power, some possibility to individual people. So data confidentiality, it's about preserving this privacy and also individual freedom. So you, you may think about the history of, of law in the West, in the Western world, where freedom is very important, individual freedom. If you compare with other civilization, if you compare, let's say, with China today, it's a different perspective. It's, for example, I was talking with a, a Chinese woman I know, and she's living in Switzerland, and we were talking about the fact that in China they are trying to um, to collect data with special recognition, like you, you cross a red light, they know it, and then you lose some social points. And if your social points go below a certain threshold, then you cannot take the plane or the trains. And this is starting now, it exists, you know, because it's this kind of um, philosophy of politics. So in the Western world, historically at least, you had a very great emphasis on freedom, like there is a space around me, you know. I can say to other people, don't come too close to me. If I choose, yes, but if I say no, no. And also the state would have like a, a had to keep some space for me, not to, to know everything about me and control me. So for this reason, this question of freedom, I think it's a huge stake for our age and our era. So there is also ethical questions. Um, one time I went in Geneva 
in a black hat SEO conference. I'm doing white hat SEO uh, work. This is one of my expertise, maybe my, my strongest expertise. And I wanted to see what those guys were doing. So I went to the conference and it was amazing just to see what they do. Like, you know, like having scripts that will like create 100 websites that will then point to a website that could point to the client website. And they would also explain how they were selling personal data between the businesses. So for example, they collect data about you and then they sell it to the next businesses. And those data have commercial values because it helps the third party business to know things about you they could not be able to know. So now, if you don't read the text, you don't know they are doing this. Because now they, they really have to write it in the conditions because of the European law and now the Swiss law. Before it was different, but now they really have to be explicit and transparent. But if you don't have no interest because it's boring to read, you don't know what they could do about it. So I think it's, it's a very important question. There is also cybersecurity, which is a, a field in itself. And cybersecurity means that unauthorized people will access to data they should not have access to, right? So I don't want to explore this too much, but it's, it's also a big stake for data protection. And finally, data integrity, meaning the notion of responsibility for the accuracy of the data. If you have a website, if you have a business, is your database accurate or are you uh, mistreating or treating unfairly people, customers, because you have wrong data in your database. I mean, it's a question also of being able to ask the business to correct data about you if it's not true, if the data is not correct. And this also, the law is saying this, you have the right to do that. So, just a word about the European law, GDRP, which came in force in 2018. It's it's, I mean, generally speaking, I'm a Swiss, so I don't like so much European Union. I think it's very uh, bureaucratic, has very strong laws, and uh, has a lot of administrative work for businesses to do to comply with it. However, in this case, I think what they did is very interesting, because really they gave back some, some power and control to individuals. So it was effective uh, May 25th, 2018, and it strengthens and unifies the protection of personal data. I will explain more about this in a few minutes for all EU member states. So in Switzerland, which is kind of in the middle of Europe, but not being in the European Union, uh, it means that it's not under this European law. However, from the point of view of the European law, if a European citizen is, is coming to Switzerland, like let's say staying in a hotel in Switzerland, um, from the European point of view, the hotel has to respect European law. But of course, it doesn't really work like this if you know how, how it works with trials in, in juridical and legal litigation. I mean, I mean, European Union you know, will not come to attack a Swiss business on Swiss territory about a law which they made in their own country. Because then what? Then Sudan can attack Switzerland because one of his citizens came here and they had a law that was saying something we were not aware of. So it doesn't really work like this. So sometimes when, when you see these kind of things, you have to remember that law enforcement is territorial bound. It's a little more complex than this. You have international treaties, but still, basically this European law was not so much in force. And as far as I know, no Swiss company were, was e ever condemned by this uh, European law. But now, of course, this new Swiss law will be in force and it's a different situation in Switzerland. So, the second part of the presentation will be about the new law in Switzerland. And I want to speak about the history of the law, the principles, what changes for private individuals and what changes for businesses. So, maybe the first thing to say is that it was a huge debate in Parliament and in Switzerland there are cantons and the cantons disagreed with, uh, with the government. So the government make a text like to apply the law, but it kind of changed what the Parliament wanted. So the cantons fired back and this process was a long process. And also in Switzerland we have two chambers in the Parliament and they disagreed for about two years. So at some points of the disagreement was what it means to profile somebody. That is to specifically have data about somebody that helps to identify this person and use this as knowledge to do things. And they were debating about a definition and it was a fight on words, but actually words are very important. 
Because if we don't care about words, the law is saying nothing and everything is meaningless, right? So it's, it's interesting to see this um, debate. And basically, you had kind of two aspects, of course. So on one side, you had people who wanted to give more freedom to protect more individuals. And the other side, also you had businesses who were saying, well, this is just crazy European bureaucracy. We don't want to do the same in Switzerland. And they were saying it's, it's, a, it's a burden for, for businesses to have to comply, to look all those cookies and make sure like it's not collecting data when it should not, and all, all those things. So when you had this kind of two, two force pushing back and forth, and since it's Switzerland, nobody wins, and it's kind of a balance between the two. And I think it's a good thing, because I think that also the interest, the economical interest of businesses not to have too much bureaucracy to go through is also important. So you have to have a balance between protecting rights, but you have also a balance that it will be not like crazy rules that takes uh, experts you have to hire or to have in-house to comply with. Again, you have to think that it will be very uh, unfavorable for small businesses if it's this kind of very bureaucratic uh, solution. Why? Because small businesses don't have the resources to deal with that. I mean, big businesses, they have like people in-house and they do this, it's a job, they are big, they have the means. But there's small businesses and in Switzerland, like it's a large majority of businesses are smaller. It's, it's a different um, economic fabric in Switzerland than in many other countries. You have a lot of uh, uh, PME, we say in French, and um, s s small, medium-sized businesses. So, and for those businesses, the many people in the parliament say we have to be reasonable with, with those rules. So now I want to give some definitions. I have just to think about the time. I started 35, right? Yeah. Okay. I want to leave time at the end for questions because I think it should be also interactive. So I don't want to be too long. So definition of personal data. This is kind of the fundamental concept is personal data means Two things, a physical person can be identified, so it is one specific human being that exists, right? So with a first name, a last name, um, and maybe an, e an email address can use to identify this person. But then they were also discussing, for example, does an IP address count as personal identification? And the answer basically is yes. But it's problematic because, let's say, if you have like your WordPress website or the server, which usually is the case, then the server will collect the IP addresses, right? I mean, you cannot like just manage technically the connection without IP addresses. So you are already collecting personal data in this sense. You cannot avoid it. But of course, there were debates, and actually there were like also litigation about saying that IP address is not exactly the same as my name or my email address, because it's less knowledge about um, the possibility to identify somebody. Also, you can imagine that if you have a lot of data about somebody, okay, it's somebody from Romania who is living in this village and who is like 35 and who likes to eat uh, Mama Liga, let's say. So then you have, enough, you have enough data to know exactly which person it is. And in this case, again, this is personal data if you are able to, to find this person. So Google has, has now, let's say, tension and problems in Europe because of this also, because it's a question that if you go into the, um, the reports, then you can find like few people and then you may know who those people are. And then if, even if they anonymize the, the IP address for us, the users user, using Google Analytics, still maybe we can find the people and you have a tension and discussion about this. Also, there is this uh, notion of sensitive data. So, for example, okay, my age and uh, my where I'm born, those kind of things are personal data about me, but they are not sensitive. So sensitive would be my religious and political opinions, would be um, data about my health, my health record problems, um, racial origin, genetic, like DNA, biometric data that helps to identify me, including facial recognition, and this is a big debate, and this debate will continue in the next years. And uh, like penal record, if I, did, if, if I had some legal issues, all this is, is considered as sensitive data. And especially for health, which is a, a huge market, it's very important to know 
okay, every like doctor or every hospital is collecting sensitive data. So they have to be double careful with what they do with those data and the law is stricter if you collect those kind of data. So for example, for your website or for your client's website, if they are just collecting names and emails, it's, it's one thing, it's one level. But if you start to collect things about religious and political opinions and health data and uh, maybe DNA, this may be rare, these kind of th things, you go to a different level and you have more risk. So you have to be more careful about how you handle those data. So the main principle of the law is three principles. One is transparency from the website owners towards the people who comes on the website. That is, the website owners has to publish a data policy, a data protection policy, to explain what it is doing with those data. And this is the first principle. So you don't have a right any longer with this law to not say what you are doing with the data. If you, if you are not saying it, then you are outside the law. The second thing is protection of the privacy of individual. And there is this notion of privacy by design. I will explain this more in depth later, but basically the idea is you stop to collect data if it's not useful and necessary. It's not like I collect as much data as I can, it's like I collect as less data as I can, but if it's useful, of course I collect it. If I'm a hotel, I have to have your name and I have to have the date you are coming to stay in my hotel because it's connected with the service I'm providing you and therefore I have to collect this data, but I can explain it also. And the last, yeah, this is so, it's a justification of data, data collected. So what changes for, let's say, Swiss citizen or people living in Switzerland on the 1st of September this year is you will have the right of portability like, exi like it exists already in Europe. So basically it means you can go to Google or Facebook or Instagram or whatever and you can ask them to give you in a standard format all the data they have about you and they have to do it. In Europe it's already the case, so most services, big services already have a mechanism for you to, in self-service, get the data about yourself. I mean, just for fun, just if you use Facebook or Instagram, just do it. I mean, find the page, Google it, find it, and ask it, and you will receive like a big file, and every like you did is in this database, imagine. Every like, every post, every reply, everything. And in Google, they have other searches. Imagine the knowledge Google has from the searches. I mean, you were sick and you searched for some illnesses, right? So Google can know, you know. You are interested in this kind of people, this kind of political opinions. So how much data they have is amazing. And just to see it, to go through and to remember, oh yes, three years ago I was looking for this and this. I mean, all this they have in a database. And it's not that they have like um, 10,000 employees looking at this day and night, but it's more that they have algorithm to sort this through and extract useful knowledge. So also you have a right with this new law to have a decision taken by a software reviewed by a human, human being. So for example, you, you know, uh, an airline company, we're speaking about airlines b before, an airline company say you cannot take the plane. And then you understand it was taken by, by a software automatically because of whatever criteria. And it's obscure, it's dark, you don't know why. So you have the right to ask that the decision is reviewed by a real living human being and that they explain how the decision was taken. So the law doesn't say that those kind of decisions are not possible and I think they will be used more and more and I think that with artificial intelligence, the level of, of the kind of decision that will be taken by software will rise, rise, rise much higher. And this will be a very important stake. Maybe you, you followed this, but Elon Musk and a bunch like 1,000 people, they just um, made a declaration about ChatGPT and other software using AI, saying that we have to calm down because it, it may just be so disruptive what those technologies will do. And at the heart of this, you have also the idea that as human being, we have relationships, it's personal, right? A computer, it can have like artificial intelligence, but it's not human intelligence, it's not lived intelligence, has no conscience, has no experience of reality. It's just electricity going in circuits, right? It's software. So it has a human-like intelligence because we designed it and created it, and it can 
like bring together a lot of data and find new things and is more quicker than us because it can process, let's say, um, I like this example. So for example, if you want to teach to a, to a software to recognize dogs and cats, you need to, to give the, the machine learning software like one million, two million pictures of a cat and of dogs. And from those millions of pictures, then it's able to, to recognize. Of course, it can process one million pictures in a few seconds. You as a human being, you could not process one million pictures in a few seconds. However, a small kid of three years, you show like three dogs, three cats, and it's done. He can distinguish. So when, when you have a lot of data, those algorithms are very powerful. But when you have a scarcity of data, humans, human beings are much, much stronger because they have a kind of sense of things that is not yet built into artificial intelligence. So here also this new right we will have here in Switzerland and exists already in Europe is that there is a data protection by design, by default, that should be enforced in all websites. So, so for you, if you create a website, it's just that you have to think about it. In the process of creating a website, you think about the design, you think about the functionalities, about the plugins you want to install, you think about many things. So it's, it's just one more thing you have to think about. This website will collect data, and maybe it will collect personal data. And therefore, it's also something you can, I mean, as a business owner, you can integrate this in your service. Like, okay, I will help my client comply with the law, and I will help them understand what kind of data they collect and how they use it. Here there is just a notice that this law in Switzerland has, has split things, and it concerns the protection of physical person, I mean, like individual human beings, and for, for the data of businesses, of moral entities, legal entities, it's not in this law, it's in a different law. I just wanted to mention that. So now, what changes from the side of businesses, right? And if you create a website, you, you create a website for businesses, certainly, or maybe you are a business and you have your own website, so you have now to, com to comply with this law if you are uh, operating in Switzerland. So the first thing is about more transparency in data management. And basically what the law is saying is you have to keep a record of data processing activities. Of course, it's not only on the web. It's maybe you have a shop and you, you collect data manually or whatever. Maybe you have other ways to collect data. But if here we speak about the web, you have to think about how your website is collecting data. And then you have to also make an effort, effort to only collect useful data. And this is privacy by default. If it's not useful, don't collect it. But actually, it's easier to collect more data than to collect less data. So you have to think about it, to decide, and then also to implement it um, at a technical level. And the third point is very interesting. is You have to keep, and here the law is kind of weak because it doesn't say the time. So it says keep only the data as long as they are useful or necessary. But how long is useful and necessary is not written in the law. So I think this will give rise to, to conflicts and will go to the um, federal tribunal at some point, I think, in Switzerland. So, but basically the idea is, for example, you have your website in which you have forms and you collect personal data because people are sending those forms. You have a database on the website, then you have a backup and the backup is on a server and then you li it, it's there forever, right? Because who is going on the Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive to, to erase like backups, you know? So it means now you have to think about it. Because if you have personal data in the database of your website, if you do backups, those backups hold this data. And then you have to think who has access to those data. So it's, it's, um, it's just like a, um, you need to take some time to sit down and think about it. And I think it's important not just to comply with the law, but just to know your own responsibility that you are dealing with data, right, with personal data. So. So, and finally, so one point of the law is that you have to publish on your website a data protection policy where you state what kind of data you collect and what you're doing with them.
Okay. So when when do I have to finish? Just to, for me to leave time for questions. Okay. So I will I will go quickly and open questions. So you have to know the data you collect on your website. You have to eliminate unnecessary personal data collection, and you have to explain to your users in a data policy what kind of data you you collect. So I spoke about forms. You can think about your server, which is logging like IP addresses with timestamps and type of browsers. So IP addresses are kind of personal data. I said it's a, it's a kind of debate, but still the answer is yes, it, it's, it allows to identify somebody specifically. So we should also, for example, like erase automatically the logs of uh, old IPs. And finally, you have to think about Google Analytics and like other analytics solutions, how they work and what kind of data is a store. You can think about hot jar and mouse flow. Like, you know, you can have like session recording, video recording, um, and also mouse flow, for example, we, we use it, um, made big, big efforts to comply with the law, like to anonymize things. But it's always, I mean, the limit is some, sometimes difficult. And also, of course, cookies, which is in itself like a huge subject. Maybe you have followed that Google is going in a cookie-less world direction. Maybe you have followed this, it's interesting, in a few years. But for now, we still have cookies. And in a website, typically in your um, protection data policy, you have to say which kind of cookie you have, how long they store data, and this kind of things. So it's a little bit technical, but you, you should do this. Um, so also you have to think about, if you are a business, who else has access to the data you are collecting? Maybe you work with an agency, maybe you work with, with a freelancer, and they have access to the data. You have to know this, you have to think about this, and in the, in the data policy, you have to say it. Now, there is a discussion if you have to say the names of the people in the company or not. Again, it's not clarified, but there was a case in, the, in Europe, in uh, Austria, that went back to the uh, court um, of Luxembourg, and they ruled that Yes, you have, uh, at least for Europe, yes, you have to give the names if asked. So you may have to be ready for this. Just one customer may ask, and then you have to give the information at least to this customer. Um, I think I already covered most, most of, of those things, so I want to open questions so we have some time. All right, thanks a lot, uh, Pascal. Um, any questions? Yes. <laughs> One here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Um, when the GDPR was um, put in place, a lot of websites, we have to put all those information. So in terms of the Swiss law, so do we have to add to the GDPR um, page where we have all the privacy policies? Um, we have to add also, we comply to the Swiss law? Well, if you do, yes, you can add this. It's, but uh, the Swiss law, basically, I, I didn't mention this, and I want to add this. So basically, the, the Swiss law is a little softer than the European law, because as I explained, maybe European Union has a more like stricter administrative view. And Switzerland is a country where you have a rule, but then you have different people applying the rule in different ways. So for example, now, because of this law, all the cantons have to adapt their own law. So on your website, if you comply with GDPR, I, I think you comply already with Swiss law, which is okay. a little lighter. I mean, I mean, maybe like a, you have to, to do a thorough com comparison to be sure, but I think basically the, the Swiss law is contained into the European law. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just something else I wanted to mention also is important is, um, so in the European Union, the fines, if you don't respect the law, can go up to 20 million euros. And even more, actually, I mean, it's, you have different cases, like 4% of the, of the gross income internationally. So it means for big company, it's a lot of money, right? Now, in Switzerland, in the law, and this was debated, it's, uh, the limit is uh, 250,000 Swiss francs. So euro and Swiss francs are basically the same. So it means for big company who are most likely to do like big violation, they can just put this in a bank account and wait for the problem and they pay it, right? So, and now the discussion is also some people in Switzerland are afraid that European Union will not accept 
that the Swiss law is the same level of protection because of this, because the dissuasive uh, effect of a smaller fine is not so, so big. And one specificity also in Switzerland is, is that it's not the company itself that is fined, but the individual who are responsible for the violation, like, like, you know, like the board of directors or the, the person who was managing the data. Uh, yeah, let me uh, um, uh, append, attend something uh, to the question here. My name is Andreas von Gunther, I'm from Datenschutz Partner. And uh, I would uh, say that if you comply to the GPDR, that's one, one thing, you know. But what you have written into your data privacy policy is something else. So which means complying to GDPR means that you are definitely mostly complying also to the new Swiss data law, that's correct, but writing in, in your, uh, you have to write in your Swiss uh, data policy that you are complying with the Swiss law. As long as your company is here in Switzerland and as long as your website is, 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 uh, is concerning Swiss customers, you have to comply with the Swiss law and not with the European law. And I also would suggest you that you don't even talk about GPTR in your data protection uh, privacy policy uh, as long as you don't have to, because as, you, as soon as you start talking about the GPTR in your privacy policy, you are you are uh, putting yourself under the GPTR uh, policy, which means, for example, for a Swiss company that you often need a, a protection um, a representative in the European Union and stuff like that. So you should be very careful in copying some uh, data privacy policies out there from the web, from Germany or from France, or where else, and put it into your website. That usually does not work. You really have to comply with the Swiss law, and which means your, protect, your privacy policy on your website has to talk about the Swiss law and not about the GPTR. Complying to the GPTR is something very good. And I would also attend to, to one small things. It's important that you know when, you, when you're working with, uh, with data, you all, almost often have data not only stored in your WordPress site, but also somewhere else. For example, your CRM, you're losing MailChimp and stuff like that. Every time you, you have that, you, we are talking about data export. And you have to comply, you have to make sure that your data export is, is legalized through a data, protect, data uh, protection addendum with your export partner. And you also have data outsourcing, sorry about that. And then you have to talk about, think about export, export in other countries, which is another very important thing. You know? As soon as you work with a, a US company, you may have the problem that this is not a safe country from, 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 uh, from the time of looking at as, as, a, as a data protector officer. So you have to comply with these rules as well. So it's, it's very, very um, um, complicated, everything, unfortunately. And even in Switzerland, it's, it gives a lot of work to do for all of you that is going to work on from 1st of September. Yes, thank you, it's a wonderful comment. Um, I mean, I think, I think also this, uh, this problem with uh, other countries, so you, you have software that can, can look at where the data is going from your website, and then typically you have the question of uh, United States, which is another complex issue, but I, I don't, we don't have time now, so other questions. Hi, thank you very much, uh, good talk. Um, I just want to add something from the technical point of view. I think it's it's really hard to actually get the technical details right as well. I mean, understanding the law is one thing, and taking the measures correctly on the technical side is another whole big world that mostly people will struggle with. So actually just checking cookies or knowing which data is processed by which entity yes. can be really, really hard. And I think that, that that's another really, really big challenge that um, a lot of people will need help with, um, just to analyzing what sort of thing should be done. Just one quick example, as we're here as a, a, at the work camp, um, if you're using a WordPress theme, you're likely to, uh, or that theme is likely to include some um, third party code from any server, actually. For example, Google Fonts. You can go on most websites and they will use Google Fonts. And that will, could be rated as a data protection viol um, violation, I think, because you are like uh, transferring or giving knowledge to that Google server um, about your, your visitors, or they know that the visitor is loading fonts from the servers. And there are so many technical issues that, yeah, are really hard to, to comply with, or actually it can be impossible. Um, if, if anyone has experience on that kind of field, I mean, you cannot just like change your whole theme to, uh, <laughs> to comply. So I think it, it will be sort of a, a chance
to um, yeah, sort of make money with by um, having a solution ready, uh, GDPR and RevDSK, um, because a lot of existing solutions won't be able to comply in general. I just want to make a comment about this. So I think we, we have also to realize that the, the entities which are likely to have problems are larger entities collecting sensitive data, as I explained. So typically, if you do something at least, you know, like you write a data policy and you try to not collect data which are um, useless, you have done your best effort, or at least an effort. And it's a big difference because basically you're, the risk you will have problems, like real problem from the... Um, I don't know how to say in English, le préposé ou la protection des données. So the federal, let's say, agent who is responsible for this is very small. If you are a small business, I mean, you just do a WordPress website, I mean, they will not have the resource and time to go after you. So, but it's important to do an effort, to do something, to think about the data, to know how it's stored, how long it is stored. So this is more of my message. And I, I completely understand, I mean, agree with you. I, I tried with one website to have everything straight, and then there was this layer. It's like inception. You have layers and layers and layers, and it's no end, right? Yeah, and then you do an update, and you end up like unknowingly include exactly. many other things that don't comply anymore. <laughs> so. Thank you. Okay, we, we have time for two more questions. Uh, so three, let's one, two, and three over there. One, yeah. one. Uh, yeah, w whatever order. <laughs> <laughs> um, just a quick and a pragmatic one. Any plugins you could suggest that should be ready by um, September 1st for the, the Swiss way of uh, data protection? What do you mean? Problematic plugins? Or? Oh, any, any plugins you know that could be ready the 1st of September? I mean, you know, what, what, we, what do we do? We need some data protection, and then we, look, we go and look for plugins, we buy them, we use no, the free I, version. No. And now I'm obviously, um, you know, what's the Swiss plugin I need to install in order to be maybe, more or less safe? Maybe you have to create it, but you have a short time now. Yeah, I, that's the point, I, I, that's I the point. I don't think there is a plugin to install. I think it's more about really like digging into what kind of data you collect, where they are stored. It's, it's a kind of, um, it's a path. You have to, to think about it. No, no plugin. <laughs> For now, at least. Yes. Second, uh, so, second. So we had the question from the VIP part over there. <laughs> it's all, all the way. Okay. I would just like to add that if you're serving any U, UA customer, probably just like the customer could take your um, service, so you are uh, ordered to to take care of the GDPR. Yes, it's what I said. So from the point of view of, of European uh, law, if, if somebody comes from Europe, then the site has to comply. It's just that in practice, how it works in tribunals, it's like it never happened from 2018 that a Swiss uh, entity, to my knowledge, was seized or attacked by the European law because, because it's in Switzerland. Exactly, but if you have like a, a company which is based in Germany, but the the main uh, uh, company or the headquarters in Switzerland, and you could probably serve somebody a service, the GDPR face can face you. And yes. I mean, the whole right is like, if nobody see it, nobody cares. But that's the right approach, in my opinion. So if you could serve any clients in the uh, EU, you need to have uh, the protection as they want it. So, I mean, you can live by like, I don't care for any right, and you could go on as yes. the site is not caring anybody. But if you want to do it right, you should take care of both. Yes, yes, I agree. And I think, but again, I think you have to, to differentiate be between big businesses, which have the means to go in all the details, and small business owners who at least should do something about it, but who not maybe comply with all the details, because also technically it's too complex. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm specially interested in publishing pictures of people on a website. Mm -hmm. uh, we know that uh, people have to give their permission to, uh, to have a, a picture of themselves published on a website and that they have to opt in. Not opting out is not good enough. So my question is, especially about group pictures, mm -hmm. if in this room there's a single person who didn't opt in, are pictures of the group then unusable? Well, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that when you, you registered for this event, you accepted conditions, and in those conditions it was written that you accept. 
that pictures are taken. And this is exactly what I was saying. I mean, no, no, that's not true. You had to, you had to check that you yeah. agree that yeah, your picture you are, is published. If you would, you, would we not have been allowed to participate if we wouldn't have checked that? I think you would. I mean, I'm not the best person to answer because this is also connected with the uh, WordPress Foundation rules. I think you would be able to, to come. But the, the default, if you're checking and say yes, 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 then if you accept it, that pictures can be taken. Then if you want an exception within this uh, consent, then maybe it's possible, but I'm not sure about this. Well, so, the, the, the question is not really answered, but we'll talk about this yeah. bilaterally. Yes. So my final word, I, mean, I, I will stop here, is, is, is just that I think every one of us has to, to, to remember that we have some responsibility with data collection, that you are part of the game of data collection, and this game has rules. So please read a little bit of the rules at least and try to make your website compliant. And it's not just to comply with the law, but it's also to, I think, just be a good citizen, you know, to, to respect the privacy of other human beings. Thank you. Thank you.